Ladies and gentlemen, this is Eurobuzz. Please welcome your hosts, Jeff Carroll and Ed Wilde. Thanks for coming, joining us for this second and final installment of Eurobuzz from the European Huntington Disease Network in Stockholm. It's been another great day of fascinating science, and while we're here to help share that uh, with the global community of HD-affected people uh, via HD Buzz, while at the same time hopefully having a bit of fun at the end of the day. But first, we do need to touch on something serious. Uh, it's been brought to our attention that a significant miscarriage of justice occurred during yesterday's Eurobuzz session. And we want to take a moment to address that. That's right. A number of people have pointed out to us that the winner of yesterday's science quiz, Dr. Michael Hayden, <laughs> was given an unfair advantage because one of the questions uh, was based on the color of his own shirt. In retrospect, we could have perhaps picked up on that, or Michael could have disqualified himself. We were troubled deeply by this a gross injustice, as I'm sure you all are. In fact, I've heard talk of little else all day. <laughs> we brought this to Michael's attention last night, and his response after the dinner and some post-dinner drinks was, I won this neuron fair and square, and I love it more than anything else in the world, and I will fight to the death anybody that tries to take it away from me. I didn't know Michael was Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> so, after some extensive negotiations, Michael has agreed to a joint custody arrangement with the true winner. The two individuals who reported that they should have won were Drs. Noina Lahiri and Doug MacDonald. And in the hope of un uh, avoiding unnecessary bloodshed, we turn to that time-tested alternative to open combat, rock, paper, scissors. So this afternoon, the belligerents reported to the balcony of justice, uh, where the game commenced. After a hard-fought game, it was Dr. Lahiri, who reigned victorious, smothering McDonald's entry-level rock with a classic English paper. We hope this gives, goes some way towards healing the sorrow caused by this event. So congratulations to the true winner, Dr. Lahiri. Okay, so now that tawdry episode is laid to rest, it's time for today's science quiz. So once again, everybody please rise majestically to your feet. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're playing for this. Charming reindeer, or possibly moose, <laughs> festooned tea towel. Yes. As a keen ornithologist, I'm a big fan of owls, but my favourite owl of all is the tea towel. <laughs> so, so sorry. Let's move on. Okay. First, a, uh, <laughs> a bit of local trivia. So, remember how this works. Think of the answer in your head, but don't say it out loud. Uh, last night we had dinner in the fabulous blue hall across the water. There is an object uh, in the hall that is the largest of its kind in Scandinavia. What is it? Okay, don't say it out loud. No cheating. Don't do a Hayden. Um, <laughs> actually, that could mean any one of a number of things. Um, all wonderful. So, if you have your answer, stay standing if you said the magnificent pipe organ. Sit down if you forgot or you didn't know. And yes, the pipe organ is the largest of its kind with 10,000 pipes. And a one reporter, oh, here it is. In the, built into the roof of the uh, room. And one reporter shared with us uh, this picture of a typical reaction by some uh, prominent EHDN attendees on first witnessing this magnificent organ. <laughs> I think we all share that reaction. Okay, we still have people standing. So the next question, Jeff. Uh, precisely as predicted by Christina Crystalball Sampaio, an observational question about the therapy session from this afternoon. Robert Pacifici of CHDI compared therapeutic development for Huntington disease to a long-distance cycle race rather than a sprint. But what was the length of the New York race that inspired Robert to realize this? Okay. Don't spit it out. All right. Everybody have an answer? 
Stay standing if you said 100 miles. 100 miles. Mm. Okay, so... <laughs> Trick question! <laughs> Some insiders are shouting that's incorrect. 100 miles was the length disclosed on stage today, and therefore the only reasonable answer Robert is telling some people it was 106 miles, mostly people who've only cycled 100 miles. <laughs> uh, he also disclosed to me, so 100 miles or 106 miles you may stay standing. He also disclosed to me that after the race he went to check in at the airport wearing the Lycra outfit, which made for an interesting security pat down. Okay, so we do still have people standing. Next question. Another Nobel Prize question. The oldest living Nobel laureate won the prize in 1986 for a topic that was mentioned today, which is the discovery of growth factors. Who is this eminent scientist? Okay, I think this is going to be a tricky one. Stay standing if you got the correct answer. Rita Levi Montalcini. Okay. Oh, do we only have We three? have two. Doug. Three people. I'm terrible at seeing standing up people. Doug in particular. Three people still standing, so we do need our tiebreaker. It's another Sweden-related question. So, closest answer wins the tea towel. What, in 2011, was the population, official population, of Sweden? Okay, we'll start at the back. Yep. 2.5 million. <laughs> Apparently, a fundamentally risible answer. <laughs> you were standing. There was someone standing in the middle. Yeah, you're still in the running. What's your guess for the population of Sweden? <laughs> Say any number. Five million. Okay, I can tell you, you've already done better than Doug. And one more at the back. 8.5 million. Okay, well, the real answer is 9.453 million. And so the gentleman at the back, who I can't see very well, come and collect your tea towel. You are today's winner. <laughs> Congratulations. Use it wisely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Now that we've got that out of the way, uh, uh, let's move to the couch to uh, talk to several of the presenters from today. Uh, as Ed and I talk with families, uh, the two technologies that we hear the most about for sure are gene silencing and stem cells. And it just so happens that we had two uh, fantastic presentations on those topics today. So we're going to speak with a couple scientists uh, about this tonight. Okay, and our first guest is Dr. Bev Davidson from Iowa. Now, Bev is best known for her pioneering work in Huntington lowering treatments for HD, but exclusively revealed to us that she was actually something of a cowboy fan as a kid. And on one occasion, at the age of 10, she responded to an advert in the back of National Geographic magazine and, unbeknownst to her parents, signed up the whole family for a holiday on a cowboy ranch a thousand miles away. So, like, please welcome Bev Gunslinger Davidson. Good evening. Have a seat. Make yourself at home. Okay, so Bev, I'll take that down. Might be a little distracting. <laughs> so, Huntington lowering treatments. Um, they're something that many people are aware of as one of the most promising possible approaches to treating or even possibly in the future preventing Huntington's. In simple terms, what's involved? So the basic principle is to sort of remove the insult, if you will, that the mutant Huntington causes the problem. Let's just get rid of it. Mm -hmm. simple, simple as that. That's an excellent answer. Beautifully simple. So a slightly less simple question. <laughs> How do you stop cells that have this mutation? It's in every cell in the body. How do you stop cells from producing the harmful protein? or reduce the amount that they produce? How do you do that? Right, so there's several methods that a number of labs are trying. So um, I tried to present a, the bulk of those this, this morning or this afternoon. And uh, we're trying various methods to reduce the mutant Huntington from being there. One is to use a mechanism called RNA interference, mm -hmm. which uh, stops the RNA from becoming a protein. And we know that that 
it stops the uh, uh, production of that mutant uh, toxic protein. Okay. <laughs> Just stepping back briefly, what's what's RNA? That's like a the way we describe right. it in HTBuzz is that that's like a message molecule between DNA in our genes exactly. and the protein, which is the thing that does stuff. So the RNA right. is the message molecule, right? Right. It's the and so I guess in a, in a sense we're trying to kill the messenger. Perfect. And uh, and if we can kill that messenger, then that protein isn't made. And the the issue is to either use uh, a delivery vehicle uh, like cerebral spinal fluid that has some uh, DNA in it that will interact with that messenger RNA and induce its degradation, or maybe we can take advantage of, of viruses that have spent a million of years evolving and use those to introduce that that molecule into the brain and, and uh, kill the messenger, if you will. Cool. So the drug in this case is actually an RNA molecule or a DNA molecule itself, mm -hmm. and that sticks to the messenger molecule inside the cell, right? That's exactly right. And then so, the cell has these has its its own built-in mechanisms already for getting rid of these messages. Right. Once they pair up, um, they become like... Uh, uh, something that the cell recognizes as needing to be degraded, and so it takes advantage of that process and chews it up. Fantastic. And it's been around for a while, not as long as the Huntington's disease gene itself. Where are we up to as regards these Huntington-lowering techniques for HD? Right, so there's, uh, as we heard this morning from uh, some uh, individuals in the CHDI Foundation, it looks like that some of these trials may commence within the next 12 to, to uh, 24 months, and that's very, very exciting. Mm. These, of course, are early stages. Mm. We need to uh, progress through testing the safety of these materials in patients and then uh, move on from what those trials tell us. And, and in your own lab, you've recently published work demonstrating the safety of your particular uh, Huntington-lowering recipe uh, in a monkey mm -hmm. brain, which is obviously a complicated brain similar to to, to the human brain. Um, why, why is it so important to do all of these trials in animals before we can take it through to patients? Right. Well, we, we don't want to take this horrible disease and make it even more horrible. Mm. That's, that's for certain. And uh, there's a lot of things that we can test in, in, in an animal model or an animal like a monkey that we can't test in rodents and we can't, you know, it's a little harder to, to test in sheep and pigs if we want to test for fine motor skills. For example, and a, and, a, and a monkey can can tell us whether or not we're causing problems by uh, knocking down or reducing the levels of that uh, that Huntington protein. Cool. And can you promise me that everyone's working as hard as they possibly can to get this to patients? We're in Iowa. There's not a lot else to do. <laughs> <laughs> Magnificent. Magnificent. Good answer. Excellent. Shall move on? Thank you, Bev. So let's move on. Our Stay next... seated, then. <laughs> you just hang out, yeah. Our next guest is Dr. Lisa Ellerby from the Buck Institute in California. Uh, if you've met Lisa, one of the things you will have noticed is she's this kind and gentle demeanor, but this belies the fact that she's a well-known pool shark. It's not all brawl ball bar room brawling. That was a good thing to pick to say on stage with Lisa. <laughs> she tells us that she insisted throughout childhood on wearing a tutu at nearly all times. Uh, it's not clear if she ever combined the two, but we've settled on this artist rendition uh, to welcome her to the stage. Uh, Lisa? And no tutu tonight, unfortunately. Welcome. So, uh, as we talk to families, uh, I, it's probably neck and neck what we hear about most, I would say, between gene silencing and stem cells. And I, I think stem cells are, in a sense, maybe the more confusing of the two, because as a scientist, it seems like there's a lot of different ways that you could use them. So um, you talked about several of these approaches, which aren't necessarily directed at therapy. So could you, in, in sort of broad terms, talk about the different kinds of things as a scientist you can do with stem cells that are helpful for HD? Yeah, so I think there's a number of things. One is that um, we have never had human models in a dish that were derived from an actual patient. So number one, we can make models that um, directly are relevant to the human condition because they come from a patient. The second thing we can do is that we've done a lot of um, screens for compounds for Huntington's disease, but they've been in mouse models. 
And there has to be... So in the past, we've used cells from mice or other organisms, and now only just recently we can use them from humans. Yeah. Right? I mean, with the the real expression levels that a patient would have and, and the expansion of normal and the expanded. So you could theoretically find perhaps um, targets that you hadn't anticipated in a human model that didn't come out of a screen from a mouse model. So that sounds like a, a big advance. But in this recent work that you talked about today, you, you actually corrected the HD mutation in these human cells in a dish. And so, you know, if you said that to a patient or family, the first thing they might say is, oh, great, this it sounds like the perfect therapeutic option. Is that realistic with this approach? Um, I think that it's... Um, it's not realistic in the short term, but I don't think that as scientists we shouldn't try to think creatively about how to do that in vivo as an eventual therapy, but it's not something that's going to happen immediately. So that's for now, it's more of a, a tool to understand the, yeah. the science of what's going wrong with the cells. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so I don't want to ask anybody to make a timeline prediction because those are always fraught, but can you describe the, the kinds of work that have to happen before we can use these kinds of new technologies to actually, for example, replace cells in the brains of, of people with HD? Um, I think that um, in terms of, in, in order to use those cells, they have to be um, safe mm -hmm. um, and go through certain um, controls. And so we're quite a way off on that. Um, okay. In Parkinson's disease, they have made um, cells that are you're able to use in transplantation, but for Huntington's disease, we don't have those things in place yet. So we still have a lot of work in, in yeah. DISH before we get to people. Right. Great. But it's worth, I think it's worth just, just briefly mentioning that this is, this, this really is a sort of a, a new era in terms of our ability to test and, uh, and study Huntington's disease. And it's the result of a uh, a large consortium that's um, that's working together to on these stem cell technologies, right? That's right. There's a huge team. Um, Leslie gave a beautiful presentation mm. today about um, gathering um, cells from different patients and modeling them. So, Wonderful. yeah, it's okay. a really good group. Thank you. Okay, so please uh, join me in thanking our guests. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, almost there. So, um, by way of introduction to tonight's HD Buzz update, uh, I'd like to tell you about the recent launch of the Chinese Huntington Disease Network. Uh, last November, we were pleased to be invited to Shanghai to attend uh, the launch of this exciting new venture. Jean-Marc Regunder, a uh, longtime member of the European Huntington Disease Network, uh, is working with colleagues in China so they can profit from the experience of the EHDN as they establish their own clinical network. So as many of you in the audience know, Huntington disease has classically been described as rare in China and other Asian countries. Um, recently, with improvements in Chinese healthcare, uh, suspected cases of Huntington disease are actually being confirmed with uh, genetic testing. Many of Jean-Marc's Chinese collaborators are establishing clinics in hospitals in China to uh, confirm uh, and treat patients with uh, Huntington's disease. Even if the prevalence is in fact lower in China, there's an awful lot of Chinese people. Uh, so there's likely to be a significant number of families in China uh, afflicted with Huntington's disease. What you're seeing behind me uh, is a recent TV special shown on national uh, TV in China about a family um, undergoing uh, predictive testing for Huntington's disease. Uh, a young uh, family member uh, being tested and going through the predictive process in China uh, to see whether she carries the mutation that's made her uh, father and sister ill. So wherever HD families live, uh, an HD family is an HD family, and we think it's important to reach out to these community members. And uh, inspired by this, we wanted to do whatever we could through HD Buzz to support this new Chinese organization and the Chinese HD community. And thanks to supreme efforts from a number of Chinese volunteers, we're thrilled to be in a position to launch a Chinese language version of HD Buzz here tonight. Expanding, why not? Expanding our potential audience by a cool one billion souls. I'm not saying they'll all visit it immediately. <laughs> so uh, just before we do that, I just want to mention that this could not have happened without the individuals named here. So please join me in acknowledging their support. Okay, so I'm English. 
I'm from the home of pantomime, and in true pantomime fashion, to launch uh, a new version of HD Buzz, the site has to be woken up in its own language. I'm assured by Mark, our technical guy, that this is the case. So, we're going to need to count down from five in Chinese. Okay? Here's how to do it. You can, you can use any of these uh, reference tables that you like, except the one on the left. The pronunciations you need are on the right in parentheses. So it's Wu, Si, San, A, I. Okay, we'll do a practice run, because it, <laughs> if, if it goes wrong, the whole thing would be a disaster. Okay, so this is the practice run. Are you with me? Okay, here we go. Wu, Si, San, A, I. That was nice. Okay. I think I can hear it stirring. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Brace yourselves. The official launch of HD Buzz in Chinese. Wu, si, san, ha, yi. Here it comes. Okay. Thank you very much for your help with that. And in case any of you suspect for a moment that that was merely PowerPoint trickery, point your web browsers on your mobile devices to zh.hdbuzz.net, which is now live. So, Before Jeff. we leave, we need to pick a winner for last night's Eurobuzz caption competition. The picture, you'll recall, reveals a really tender moment between Alexander Durr and Bernard Landermeyer. From our barrage of suggestions, Ed and I have very unscientifically chosen three finalists. So everybody wants to get to the bar. We don't have time to go through this twice. Your initial reaction to the uh, caption suggestions will determine the winner. So the more funny you think it is, the louder you clap. What's that you say, children? What's the prize? <laughs> oh dear, I'm, <laughs> I'm on a slippery pantomime slope. The prize is this. Magnificent trophy with built-in super accurate thermometer. And as you all know, it is, of course, in the shape of a moomin, which is a traditional, fictional hippopotamus creature worshipped throughout Scandinavia. Okay, I'm going to place that there. So, but first we have to give an honourable mention for a, a competitor who wished to remain unnamed, who suggested, Jill told me she wants a clothes peg, just like Sarah. Pretty good, all right. So, our three finalists who were prepared to be named. First, Chris Sherbin, with the following. For the last time, Alexandra, the boats leave for the town hall at 18.30. Good reaction. That's good, Good yeah. reaction. This is going to be difficult, I think. Careful you don't reach ceiling too soon. Next, then, Martin Della Tiki. <laughs> Alexandra, have I told you about my expansion? <laughs> and finally, <laughs> around lunchtime I was handed from the floor to the balcony an extremely grubby piece of paper containing or approaching a dozen obscene suggestions <laughs> From one, Bill Crowder. This is unsurprising. Bill is from Liverpool. That's how they do things there. This is the only one that was even close to being publishable. Jill says, that's an interesting mouse model she's holding. <laughs> to which, wait for it, to which Bernhard replies, mm, yes, don't you just love multiple organisms? <laughs> I think that's pretty clear. Okay. Well, it was close, but I think in the end the winner is obvious. Uh, is Bill here? Bill, you are the declared the winner. Come and collect your moomin. Here he comes. <laughs> Come into the spotlight, Bill. There we are. Congratulations. Bill, official representative of the UK Huntington's Disease Association. <laughs> Are you
your home city would be proud of you. Okay. And so, as the moomin of time snuggles up to the snork maiden of eternity, <laughs> one for the locals there, um, it's over to Jeff for some final remarks. So we'd like to close, finally, uh, by thanking the audience and our guests for being good sports and what was actually a fairly ridiculous evening. Uh, this has been good fun for us. More importantly, we hope that we're able uh, to bring the excitement that we felt today uh, with all the great science uh, to our audience of uh, affected families at home uh, via HD Buzz. So uh, without further ado, thank you, good night, and get your butts to the bar.